I see a great parallel, a, a congruent of similarities, if you will, between Juneteenth and the current state of Christendom, especially Western Hemisphere Christianity. Now, this might be education to some, but then a reminder to others. But just bear with me as I attempt to articulate why I believe there is not a great gulf between Juneteenth and the Christian faith. Y'all ready for this? Okay, quick history lesson. On September the 22nd of 1862, during the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln set forth an Emancipation Proclamation, which is the freeing of the slaves. This, however, did not go in effect until January 1st of 1863. But the slaves down south didn't get the memo. There were certain slave owners that did not want to let their slaves know that they're free. Okay, now I'm about to get in trouble. In a similar fashion, there are a lot of religious sectors, religious churches, here we go, spiritual leaders that do not want to let us know the freedom that we have nor do they want us to operate in biblical intelligence because if I start to read the Bible for myself if I start to have my own relationship y'all don't want to talk to me with God myself I will no longer tolerate your spiritual and taking scripture out of context abuse they didn't want to let the slaves know that they have been set free just like some churches don't see like I can get you to idolize me if I don't point to him you know how many people are fans of their pastor like fans of their church let's go ahead and set the record straight y'all didn't come here to hear Jerry Flowers Jr. you came to hear a word from the Lord I need to attend a place that carries the soundtrack of heaven I'm not here for a person. I'm here to give God the glory, to give God the praise. I need to be in a place that produces the soundtrack of heaven. I'm not following a man. I'm following Jesus. I'm never going to be a slave to people's acceptance and what they think about me. That's exhausting. You are here to hear from Jesus. Now, this is easily seen in our churches with our struggle and our inability to introduce ourselves outside of our title go to conferences all the time how you doing i'm jerry i'm bishop such and such i'm prophetess such and such i am apostle such and such i am episcopal pastor such and such i am superintendent pastor of mount herman show enough save missionary baptist church of god in christ under the pastoral stewardship of Bishop Gabriel III. All these titles. I'm like, we have many thrones in our pulpit. Y'all ever seen churches like that? Many thrones in our pulpit. I'm like, don't you know you are serving? Okay. How is it Jesus could come into Jerusalem on an ass? I didn't curse, that's Bible. He comes in Jerusalem on an ass but you got to get picked up in a limo <laughs> like, like okay you have to have 5,000 people there before you speak but Jesus would speak in private and say don't tell nobody y'all seeing this Jesus could have came in Jerusalem on a 16 plated gold chariot and say here comes Messiah but he was so humble enough to come in on a donkey. September the 22nd of 1862, Abraham Lincoln set forth an Emancipation Proclamation, which did not go into effect until January the 1st of 1863. But the slaves down south didn't get the memo until June 19th of 1865. So what do we have from January the 1st of 1863 to June 19th of 1865? We have free people living like slave people. Did y'all hear what I just said? We have free people living like slave people. I see a great similarity between Christendom and Juneteenth because currently on today, we have free people living like slave people. 
slave to people's acceptance, slave to people's endorsements, slave to bitterness. Like, do you not understand if you don't forgive somebody, you are establishing for them to be your prison warden? So you go stay in prison and you have given them the power to get you out by I'm sorry. If they don't say I'm sorry, I'm going to stay in the prison of bitterness. (laughs) Slave to dopamine hits. This is why we're doing this series, y'all. This is why we're doing exit strategies. You know why? This is the irony of temptation. The demented thing about temptation is it promises to help you escape a current discomfort. To only end up selling you to another slave master. Did y'all hear what I just said? If I was a note taker, I'd write that down. Yeah, that's what temptation does. Come here. I'm going to help you escape your current discomfort, but I'm only going to sell you to another slave master. So come here. I'm going to help you escape loneliness, but I'm going to make you addicted to an orgasm exchange with a toxic man, with a toxic woman. Y'all don't want to talk to me. I'm going to help you escape. By just giving you another slave master. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to help you escape your fear of what people think by getting you addicted to pressing next episode. Like instead of you living out your calling and being on your, your, your biblical duty, you keep wasting time playing call of duty. <laughs> like this is time you could be using to formulate your business plan. Talk to me, somebody. This is time you could be using to perfect your podcast. This is time you could be using to improve your culinary skills because excellence separates. But you're going to allow fear to cause you to be barren. This is something that freed me. And I learned this back in 2016. People always rather critique then create. The people who are in the comment section, they love to critique more than they create. Now, creators don't really have time to critique because I'm trying to critique what I'm creating. But people who don't create nothing always have time to critique. (laughs) That's what temptation does. Helps you escape a current discomfort only to sell you to another slave master. Come here, I'll help you escape the stress of today. It was stressful, wasn't it? I'm going to help you escape by causing for you to be addicted to a joint. I'm going to cause you to be addicted to an alcoholic beverage so that whenever you feel stressed, you don't run to the king's present. You run to an aisle or to a plant. Talk Holy Ghost. I can help you, but that is what temptation does. It only sells you to another slave master. And I came this afternoon to let us know there was another emancipation proclamation. Over 2,000 years ago, Jesus set forth an emancipation proclamation. So now we no longer have to be slaves to sin and slaves to bondage and slaves to pride. But in him, we can have life and life everlasting. How about let's give a real praise to the God who set us free. Now, don't get it twisted. I'm not just talking about free where you change your behavior. I'm talking about the freedom that changes desires. Like, I don't want to do it anymore. Like, I don't want to go back there. There's a time when you still will, and we're dealing with that. That's okay. But I want to be free and free indeed. I don't even want it. And I just felt led by the Holy Spirit for part three of this brand new sermon series, Extra Strategies. I believe this afternoon we need to speak around this thought from this subject, unlearning abuse. Unlearning abuse. Have you ever considered that the most abusive person that you will ever meet in your life is the person that's staring right back at you in the mirror? I know when we think about abuse, it's always them. But have you ever considered, I've been abusing me. 
The things that I tolerate is abuse to me. The things that I eat, y'all don't want to talk, it's abusing me. The conversations I'm entertaining, it's really abusing me. Looking on Facebook at your memories on something you used to have that causes you to reflect on a season where you had no Holy Spirit encounter and you begin to miss what you used to have because that's what temptation does. It causes for you to romanticize memories but forget hangovers. Could it be possible just want us to think, could it be possible that I have been abusing me and God wants to help us unlearn the comfort you found in abusing your spirit? The reason is so hard for many of us to let things go is because I found comfort in that. Can I mess y'all up? Sometimes you have to unlearn church so that you could actually learn Jesus. Isn't that crazy? Unlearn abuse. Father God, we thank you for this moment. Thank you for being a father to the fatherless. And our prayer, oh God, is would you help us to unlearn toxicity. Help us to unlearn any and everything that is parasitic to our growth and our development. Father, we rebuke the enemy and remind him that he is a defeated foe. He can't have access to my children, access to my home, access to my mind. Help us to walk in that victory versus living as a victim. And I thank you, Father God, most importantly, that all the study means nothing. If you are magnified, if you are glorified, anoint me as your oracle, the PA system, the soundtrack of heaven. I'm asking that you do it in Jesus' name. And everybody who agrees with that prayer would just shout in the room, amen. 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 So there is this confession I want all of us to say. And everybody watching online, if you could put this in the room in all caps. Can I get us to say this? This is personal for me. Father, Father, expose, expose, reveal, reveal, and remove remove any pattern, pattern, personal mindset mindset in my life life. that's abusive to my spiritual growth. One more time. Father, Father, expose, expose, reveal, reveal, and remove remove any pattern, pattern, person, person, or mindset mindset in my life life. that's that's abusive to my spiritual growth. Does anybody believe and pray that? Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, as we continue the cruise line of this brand new sermon series, Exit Strategies, there is something from these passages of scripture that I would like to show you in just a few moments that really is revealing a strategy on us to operate in deliverance and strengthen our ability to not go back to the plantation of cynicism and recycled sin. Now, remember, I told us for this series, this series is going to be a little more meat to it because I recognize I cannot serve us with biblical strategies on how to get out of strongholds. See, Culture calls it addictions. The Bible calls it strongholds. I cannot help us and serve us with biblical strategies on how to get out of strongholds by giving you milk. I can't. Because after a while, even offering offering milk is contributing to your malnourishment. Milk is cool when you're five months old. Milk is even cool when you're one years old. But when you eight, (laughs) I need something more than just milk. And I want us to understand this. There is a war over your appetite. Please hear me, y'all. I'm speaking prophetically. There is a war over your appetite. And both heaven and hell want your appetite. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled. What is that? Your appetite. You won't surely die. For God knows when you eat this fruit, you will be like him, knowing the good and the evil. What is Satan's first original sin? He's after Eve's 
appetite. I want you to try to feed the feeling of not being enough. You already made in the image and likeness of God. The first warfare strategy and the first warfare attack was orbiting around appetite. Somebody say appetite. appetite. So why? As I'm studying. Why is the warfare over our appetite? It's because your appetite is directly affected, directly connected to your level of obedience. You cannot obey Beyond the level of your appetite. Does this make sense? And until I develop spiritual taste buds for health. Until I desire health, I will keep on consuming abuse. Consuming toxicity. And consuming spiritual poison and just label it an acquired taste. Ain't nobody perfect. God ain't through me yet. Don't judge me. That's not Bible. That's Tupac. <laughs> we'll label it a acquired taste. And there's this weapon. I'm like, why are we not preaching about this enough? There is this weapon, this, this subtle, crafty weapon that the enemy is using that for most of us, it goes undetected. We think his weapons are always assaults. There are always people acting crazy. But what if I told you one of the slept on weapons of the enemy is the weapon of comfort? Talk, Holy Spirit. It's the weapon of comfort. I want you to live in sin and be comfortable. I want you to curse them out, be on one, and be comfortable in it. Comfortable. Listen, y'all, discomfort is the main ingredient for unlearning and life change. See, we got this thing so backwards. We have been blaming the devil. Like anything in your life that's uncomfortable, we blame the devil. But what if I told you we have been blaming the devil for a God process? See, this is why you're rebuking it and it's not moving. Because it's not the devil. It's not the devil. God will make you uncomfortable so you can change. Whatever has your attention, I will begin to disturb it until I have yours. And so what we have been recognized is it's not necessarily, necessarily the devil who is always making us uncomfortable. It's God putting us in a position to unlearn what we used to find comfort in. Like when you are uncomfortable, what do you smoke? When you are uncomfortable, who do you call? When you are uncomfortable, what do you watch? And so God is trying to make you unlearn what you label as comfortable. I know we're not going to get a lot of claps. Just like last Sunday. Remember last Sunday? It was real hot in here. Bible all day. We confuse it. We think following Jesus means we're going to get comfortable. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. You don't have to turn there. I just want you to see this. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. This is Jesus talking. He says, uh, whoever is my disciple. <laughs> y'all see y'all face. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross sometimes. Take up their cross when they feel like it. Take up that cross when they come to church. Take up your cross daily and follow me. Okay. Denying yourself is not comfortable. Y'all preach to me. I want y'all to remember your own voice when y'all hear this. Denying yourself is not. Holding your tongue is not. Yeah, y'all talking. Y'all preaching. I can sit down, Chris. They can come up. Picking up your cross daily is not comfortable, but it's the quality of a disciple. What I'm trying to get us to see is we've been labeling anything that's uncomfortable. I don't know, bro. That just disturbs my peace, bro. It's just something about that church. It just, it just disturbs my peace. Or could it be it disturbs the bedchamber of your comfort and compromise? 
So I don't want to hear that because when I go to church, I feel so uncomfortable. <laughs> Anything that's comfortable, we blame as the devil when it's actually the devil who will give you false comfort in exchange for your peace. So we'll start saying stuff like, you know what? Ever since I tried that Jesus stuff, my life got worse. <laughs> Ever since I've been listening to your podcasts, your sermons, your therapy Thursday coming to your church, my life got worse. You know what it really is? It's your false comfort has spoiled. Okay, all right. What it really is, your false comfort has spoiled. All Jesus is doing is showing you that's going to expire, but I can fulfill it. That's going to expire, but I'm going to feel. But it used to be so good. Okay, um, would you drink milk that used to be good? Talk, Holy Ghost. Would you drink milk that used to be good? This is why the dopamine hits aren't hitting like they used to. It's because that has expired. Your false comfort has spoiled. And Jesus is just saying, you know what? Being petty, that has expired. Cursing them out, that has expired. That website, that has expired. I wish I had a people under the sound of my voice who would recognize it's not the devil. It's just that false comfort spoiled. And Jesus is showing us that. That used to give you comfort. That's expired. Can I get somebody to shout, that's expired. that's expired? Let's make it uncomfortable. Fist bump two people and tell them that's expired. Like punch the knuckle so hard to where you hear crack. That's expired. That's expired. So here's the crazy thing. If it has expired, why do we keep drinking it? And then you want to meet with me because you feel nauseous. You want to meet with me because some ain't sitting right. When I'm trying to tell you from the pulpit, we don't need a meeting. It's your drinking stuff that's spoiled. Listen, you cannot have a finding without a forsaking. So many of us want to find joy, but you won't forsake false comforts. You want to find fulfillment. But you won't forsake putting your identity in your achievements. Finding must be followed by a forsaking. Because dysfunction will make you loyal to abuse. Talk Holy Spirit. Dysfunction will make you loyal to abuse. Lethal loyalty. I'm loyal to stuff that's lethal to my growth. And self-abuse, please hear me, self-abuse will cause for you to sabotage the healthy relationships in your life to affirm your fears. This is so good, y'all. So you'll say stuff like, I don't do people. I don't do people. I don't trust nobody. No, I'm not going to your event. I'm good. I don't, I don't trust anybody. And so the people that God is sending to help you heal, you sabotage that so that you can affirm everybody leaves me. This is good, y'all. Hell uses comfort. I want you comfortable in your rebellion. I want you comfortable in your deception. The war is over your appetite. And see, he's crafty. Because sometimes the trick in the deception is not taking your appetite. It's just keeping your appetite at the same level. Okay? So if I can't get you to go back, I'm going to get you to stay stuck at where you're at. Okay, so I know if you enter a new season, but you have an old appetite, that's my deposit that you will return to old places. I don't have to take the appetite. Let me just make sure they're okay with consuming spoiled stuff so that when the new season comes and they experience this comfort, they'll go back to an old comfort. 
And we can't see it. You know why? Our at least list. I'm honest enough to say I've had one. Anybody else? Your at least list. At least I went to church. It's hot outside too. I got up. I got dressed. At least I served. At least. It's our at least list that blinds us that we do the least. (laughs) We do the least. This happens also in relationships. Woman, at least I came home. That's bare minimum, bruh. You want brownie points that you came home? At least. Keeps us blinded to the fact that we don't crave forward because we're comforted by familiar. But I just believe, and the goal of this series is to get people under the sound of my voice to recognize expiration dates. To where we've got to this place. You know what? I'm ready to shift by any means necessary. If I lose some friends, that's okay. I'm ready to shift. If people badmouth me, that's okay. I'm ready to shift. If he or she breaks up with me, that's okay. I'm ready to shift. And some people don't understand why you're shifting. It's because they see what you see, but they don't hear what you hear. They don't hear what you hear. Why are you saving like that? Because in my spirit, I heard shift. Why are you working out like that? Because in my spirit, I heard shift. Why did you get off, sh- off, so- off social media? It's because in my spirit, I heard shift. Why y'all looking for land in a bigger building? It's because in my spirit, I heard shift. Somebody shout shift. This is why it's dangerous for you to be surrounded by spiritually deaf friends. Because they will criticize you based on what they see, but they don't hear what you hear. That sounded good. One more time. Somebody shout shift. Shift. So as I was looking at a few texts and and begin to pray, anytime I feel like God is leading me a direction, I always want to make sure I'm preaching rhema, not my opinion. So I'm like, okay. Why are, we, why are we going this route? I'm learning abuse. That sounds like something, God, we should have done in heart rehab or something. It's because the reason my people cannot break free from certain addictions is because they're comfortable. He gave me an acronym. You know what abuse is? It's aggressive bondage under satanic expression. Abuse. I know it was the Lord. I, I'm not that smart. <laughs> abuse. It's aggressive. People who are verbally abusive. What is that? It is aggressive bondage under satanic expression. Physical abuse. It is aggressive bondage under satanic expression abuse. And many of us haven't even recognized that we are abusing ourselves. Anytime we choose sin, it is Self-abuse. Self-abuse. I want us to look at this passage of scripture in Exodus chapter 16. Before we go there, just so that everybody gets this, I want us to see this image. This is what unlearning looks like. Let's put it on the screen. This is what unlearning looks like. Wilderness. There is nothing here that can provide you with comfort. When you are in a season of unlearning, God literally strips everything away that made you comfortable. Because I want to teach you to find comfort in me. So if anybody feels like you've been in a wilderness for years, I'm telling you prophetically why. It's because God is saying you have been trying to find comfort outside of me. I have literally, why do I feel like I'm so empty? I have emptied everything out of your life that you were using to try to play to replace me. This is what I'm learning looks like. There is nothing there that will provide you comfort there's no boat there's no house there's no pool it's just hot you stand behind a mountain too long maybe a mountain lion may come behind you 
you walk and you getting sand all in your sandals, all in your foot, you might hear a little rattlesnake, you're on edge. Nothing in this season is going to provide you comfort but my word. Look at this, y'all. Exodus chapter 16, verse 1, says the whole Israel, Israelite community set out from Elam and came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai on the 15th day of the second month after they had come out of Egypt. In the desert, the whole assembly, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat. Ate all the food we wanted. Somebody say appetite. appetite. But you have brought us up out of this desert to starve this, uh, this entire assembly to death. They don't even recognize God is trying to make you starve. But he's trying to starve Egypt out. Okay. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day, in this way, look at this, y'all, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. Hmm. So I'm looking at this text, and I notice first thing that pops off to me is discomfort exposes appetites. <laughs> first thing, discomfort exposes appetites they kept on complaining we remember in Egypt we had meat I remember last year people were inviting me to the 4th of July I haven't got one invitation pastor I remember last year people used to turn up and call me ain't nobody checked on me my phone's so dry I'm playing with the sentence I don't have nobody hit me up nobody they just kept on what like if you let people talk long enough they will reveal their heart type it's not judging this bible all day Jesus says in Luke chapter 6, verse 45, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So let me put it this way where we can better understand it. The tongue is the paintbrush of the heart. Okay? The tongue is the paintbrush. Ooh, ooh, mama, can I mess them up? The tongue is the paintbrush of the heart. Here's the question on the floor. Who's been painting on you? If the tongue is the paintbrush of the heart, who's been painting on your thoughts? Who's been painting on your desires? Who's been painting on your cravings? They're complaining. Constantly complaining and whining. And I'm like, okay, God, he could have took them straight to the promised land. He's God. He could have. But I want you to notice how God disciples. The first thing he does is let me bring you out of slavery and let me place you in unlearning. This is powerful, y'all. Why do I keep doing it? You have resisted the unlearning. He's trying to get them to unlearn the abuse of Egypt. Unlearn it. He literally rains down bread of heaven called manna for them to consume. Now watch this. He says, just get enough, though, for today. Let me be your daily bread. Why? Because slaves have a shortage mentality. I have to hoard because if I don't, I have to store this if I don't. I'm not giving this because if I do, I might lose this. Slaves have a hoarding mentality. Heaven is not in a pandemic. Heaven doesn't have a shortage. Heaven is not in a recession. I'm trying so hard, y'all, to teach this and not preach it. I'm trying so hard to retain, rest, like restrain Mr. Preach. He keep rising up. I'm trying to teach y'all. He says, get enough just for today. Why? I want you to learn trust. I want you to trust the same God that provided for you yesterday is the same God that's going to provide for you today. 
The same God that provided for you yesterday is the same God that's going to provide for you tomorrow. You remember the last time you didn't know how to overcome, I provided a way out. You remember the last time you didn't know how to pay rent, I provided a way out. I'm trying to give you trust. I learned those pots. That's a comfort that spoils. God is trying to teach his people, trust me daily. Trust me daily. Don't store up. Just trust me daily. Trust that the same God that caused a sun to rise is the same God that's going to cause for manna to fall. Trust me daily. I know you're in a pandemic. Trust me daily. I know your husband left. Trust me daily. I know she left you. Trust me daily. Don't take extra. Trust me. Trust me. And every single time it got hard, their appetite was exposed. Somebody say unlearning. 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 Growth is not just confined to what you learn. Growth is also unlearning old comforts. One more time. Growth is not just confined to what you learn. It's also unlearning old comforts. Your becoming is tied to your unbecoming. I put you in this season so you could unbecome, so that you can become. Is this making sense? Yeah. All right, I want y'all to see this chart. I really try to break it down where we can understand it. Because the genesis of discipleship is to unlearn what you have learned. Did y'all hear what I just said? The genesis of discipleship is for you to unlearn what you have learned. All right, so the first part, you're in Egypt. Somebody say slavery. Slavery. I'm bound to sins, porn, masturbation, fornication, adultery, drugs, turning up one time for the one time, club scene after club scene, strip club after strip club, like all of that, that's when you are slave. You are bound to whatever your flesh says do. You in line, your flesh says, look at that Snickers. It look good, don't it? Buy it. All right. Small stuff. I'm serious. You laughing? But there are some people who are struggling with food. Whatever your flesh tells you to eat, you do. So what God does, he says, okay, I'm going to bring you out of bondage, but we're not going straight into the promise. You're going into discomfort. You're going to cry. It's going to hurt. You're not going to like this season, but you're going to like the next one, though. I need you to embrace the discomfort. And there are some people, listen, we're learning from this text. This first generation of the Israelites died in Egypt. They never got to the promised land because they could not deal with the discomfort of unlearning. And I'm speaking to us prophetically. I don't want you to die short because you can't unlearn. Discipleship. Unlearn what you have learned. Unlearn when it's cold, you need to bathe. No, you don't. Crank up the heat. Unlearn when it's hot, you got to show your body. No, you don't. You can go in your bathroom and flex all day if you want to. Unlearn what was your comfort. Okay? And then he says, okay, while you are dealing with the discomfort of unlearning abuse of Egypt, now I'm going to give you manna for relearning. Jesus is literally referred to as the living bread. How they were living, how they were living in the wilderness was from living bread. I am helping you live by you being fulfilled and quenched by me. Are y'all seeing this? Unlearn the abuse of Egypt. Let me give you more Bible. Exodus chapter 17. Is this good for anybody? Exodus chapter 17, verse 1. The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of sin, traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. They camped in refitting, but there was no water for the people to drink. Somebody say thirsty. thirsty. All right. So they quarreled with Moses. Why do we keep, see this? This is if I was at a pastor's conference, I'd be like, y'all notice how they keep complaining to us about what God is trying to do in them. 
Why are you arguing with me? I'm not doing it. I'm helping you get to the promised land. Why you got a problem with me? Why you leave reviews about me? I'm just trying to help you get there. I couldn't have been Moses. I I'm sorry. All right. Uh, they quarreled with Moses. Moses says, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for water there. And they grumbled against Moses. They said, why did you bring us up out of, look at this, y'all, Egypt. <laughs> Are y'all seeing this? To make us and our children and livestock die of thirst. This part was funny. I actually laughed when I was preparing the sermon. Verse 4, Moses cried out to the Lord, what am I to do with these people? <laughs> I'm so tired of y'all. What am I to do with these people? <laughs> they are almost ready to stone me. The Lord answered Moses, go out in front of the people. Take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel. Hold on. Last week, we saw a foreshadowing of Jesus by Adam. God put to sleep, took out of his side a rib, and then presented to him his wife. We saw Jesus on the cross. He was struck and pierced in his side and blood and water flowed. And by that blood, we can now be his wife. But I see also another foreshadowing. They were thirsty and they didn't know how to be quenched. He says, okay, strike the rock. Jesus was on the cross for thirsty people. They struck him in his side and water flowed out. The foreshadowing is Jesus saying, only I can quench that. A man can't quench that. An achievement can't quench that. An orgasm can't quench that. An high can't quench that. A house can't quench that. Only I can quench your thirst. Jesus is the rock. Let me give you more Bible so that you can see this. I'm going to read this from the Message Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. It says, remember our history, friends, and be warned. All our ancestors were led by the providential cloud and taken miraculously through the sea. They went through the waters in a baptism like ours. As Moses led them from enslaving death to salvation in life, look at this, y'all. They all ate and drank identical food and water, meals provided daily by God. They drank from the rock, God's fountain for them that stayed with them wherever they were and the rock was Christ but just experiencing God's wonders and grace didn't seem to mean much most of them were defeated by temptation during the hard times in the desert and God was not pleased this rock that they're drinking from is a foreshadowing of Christ. Whenever you're thirsty, I could quench that. Whatever area in your life you feel unsatisfied, it's because you're trying to get false comforts that have spoiled to quench what only I could do. Remember part one, they're passing sins. Only I could quench that thirst. This is why if you walk around thirsty, you risk settling for watered down love. Let me keep going. Keep going. I ain't got time to bother that. We'll talk about that in October. I want y'all to see another scripture because I saw something else. Psalm 78, verse 15. It says, he split the rocks in the wilderness, hold on, he split the rocks in the wilderness and gave them water as abundant as the sea. When Jesus was on the cross and he died, the veil was split. Are y'all seeing this? I told you I got to give you some meat. The veil was torn from top to bottom. God knows your deliverance happens from your top to your bottom. 
You want just to go to the next level. What is that? Your feet, your bottom. But God's like, the way you're going to get to the next level is from the top to the bottom. I have to first get you to unlearn here. Read the text, sir. He split the rocks in the wilderness and gave them water as abundant as the sea. He brought streams out of the rocky cray and made water flow down like rivers, but they continued to sin against him, rebelling in the wilderness against the Most High. Not against Moses. They spoke against God. They said, can God spread a table in the wilderness? True, he struck the rock and water gushed out. Streams flowed abundantly, but can he also give us bread? Can he supply meat for his people? <laughs> right here in the text, we're seeing God is trying to help them unlearn. Unlearn the pots and deal with the discomfort. Because if you look at this text closely, you'll see that they want it out, right? But what I noticed during sermon prep time, did you catch what their out was? Their out was back. They were uncomfortable and they wanted out. But their out was back. Back to Egypt. What is your out? Is it back to a bottle? What is your out? And is your out back to a person? Back to a place? Because if so, we're just like the Israelites. We want out of the discomfort of unlearning only to go back to being false comforted. Unlearning. Unlearning. I want you to unlearn violating your spiritual disciplines and boundaries that the Holy Spirit has helped you establish so that you can please people. You have become a version of yourself that they can digest at the expense of suffocating your own authenticity. I want you to unlearn that. Unlearn that. I want you to unlearn believing that your self-worth is in what you could buy, your achievements. Listen, y'all. If it's anything that you could buy, apply, wear, if it could burn, if it could corrode, and if it could fade, is vanity. So why attach your value to something that doesn't last? Did y'all hear what I just said? What you could wear, your clothes, your makeup, something you could apply, something you could buy. If it could burn, fade, corrode, why put your value in that which can be subject to fire and burn away? I want you to unlearn. I want you to unlearn the cultural definition of success. So many people view success in a wrong way and they climb the ladder of success. And when they die, they'll recognize they were climbing up the wrong wall. Success. I told us this all year. It's being occupied with your God-given task. That's success. I need us to unlearn the culture's definition of beauty. I promise nothing's wrong with the way you look. It's the culture's definition of beauty that we need to question. Like they used to say, a picture is worth a thousand words. Now I'm like, a picture produces a thousand lies. <laughs> Photoshop, you don't look like that in real life. Y'all ever seen somebody? I mean, you do not look like that. You don't. I mean, you catfished the mess out of me. You don't look like that. I could do a whole series. You know what I could call it? Insta-Christianity. <laughs> it's Christianity where we apply filters, the right lighting, the right exposure, the right contrast. But if you ever talk to me outside of the church, that's not how I really am. I learned that. I learned that. I learned that. Let it go. Somebody said, let it go. Let it go. That's, that's, that's the beauty of one of my favorite seasons, fall. Yeah. Fall is my favorite season. It's just perfect. You can wear long sleeve, short sleeve. Sometimes Houston doesn't even give us a fall, but when we do get one for two days, <laughs> the beauty of fall is nature is showing us how beautiful it is to let stuff go. I need you to unlearn that so you can admire somebody else's beauty 
without questioning yours. I need you to unlearn that where you can admire somebody else's ministry without questioning what God is going to do with yours. Unlearn that. I need you to unlearn that so you can be with somebody and not lose yourself in them. Unlearn that. Unlearn that. I want you to unlearn that to such a degree to where you could understand, understand that for many of us, the battle scars we have, stop blaming them. If we be real, the battle scars that we have, if somebody were to ask you, Jerry, who did it? I would have to say, I did. I did. So there is a level of unlearning that takes place so that you could truly be delivered. Unlearn, like unlearn not celebrating your milestones because theirs is bigger. You don't know what they had to sacrifice or compromise to get that. You doing it with integrity. She had to do it with laying down with bodies. She caught so many bodies, she could be an undertaker. But you saying, I, ooh, you saying, ooh, I wish I had something like that. You don't know what it cost her to get it. So now let, let's, let's look at this second chart. The second chart. Or we can see how this operates. The second chart about the flesh has over been, has then we overcame it. So now after you have the manna for unlearning, God is trying to get it where you thirst for living water. Like some of us couldn't wait to get to church. I can't wait to, I want you to get to that place to where you're not opening your Bible when I tell you to. But on your own, you don't even feel right if you wake up and not talk to God. Like th there was a time when I wake up, just go, start my day, but now I don't even feel right. Is there anybody honest enough to admit when I don't pray, I'm more moody? Anybody? Skip devotion in the morning. Let somebody cut you off. But you pray, they cut you off. I just came out of prayer. <laughs> you just seem to be more generous. You in the store, they only got two lanes open. Two. And then they're trying to hurry up and close self-checkout. That's all right. I'm just thankful I could buy my food. <laughs> Let you not spend time with God. This is trifling. Y'all got too much money. <laughs> after, <laughs> after the thirst, that's when you enter the promised land. Now, what I'm trying to get us to understand, until we get the thirst, we can't be trusted with the promise. See, look, 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 look. God is not looking for perfect people. He's not. He's looking for people he could trust. He's looking for those who know without you, I'm going to look like a fool. Without you, I get up here every week. I'm like, God, without you, I'll be rambling and stuttering. I can't do this without you. Those are the people he could trust with success because those who don't trust him, he can't give you success. You know why? Success will make you lose your sense. I'm self-made. God in heaven like, for real though? <laughs> self-made? Okay. Okay. Now, this is the powerful part. I don't know how I missed this. Out of all the books in the Bible, I've read the gospels the most. Over and over and over. I really studied Christocentric practice, meaning Christ-centered text. I really studied the Gospels the most because if I'm going to be a Christian, I need to know all about Jesus, right? And I was like, how in the world have I read the Bible and the Gospels so many times and I did not see that Jesus' first sermon, like I was looking at his sermon notes this weekend. He let me borrow them. I'm looking at his sermon notes, and I was like, how did I miss Jesus' first sermon was about unlearning? How did I miss that? The first sermon, look, let me show you. Matthew chapter 5. We're going to do a little hopscotch. We're going to see this. This is just some of his sermon notes, okay? Matthew chapter 5, verse 21. Jesus says, you have heard that it was once said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with their brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Let's look at more of his sermon notes. Matthew chapter 5, verse 27. He says, you have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery. 
But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Most sermon notes, Matthew chapter 5, verse 38. He says, you have heard that it was said eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. Give you more sermon notes. Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. He says, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your neighbor and pray for those who persecute you. The common tone was, you have heard, but I tell you. Y'all missing it. You have heard, but I tell you. You learned it this way, but this is the way you really should learn it. The whole sermon is about unlearning what you have heard. Because I got something else you need to learn. Discipleship at the basic elementary foundation is unlearning what you have heard. It's first sermon. Straight out of the wilderness himself. I'm like, gosh, are y'all seeing this? After he came out of the wilderness of being tempted, then he told people, you have heard. After I was in a process of being tested, let me teach you how to handle when you are tested. Unlearn. 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 Like I articulated on Therapy Thursday, the three U's. Three U's on inside of you. The you you're called to be, the you you used to be, and the you you currently are. And the point of this series is so that the Holy Spirit could use us to teach you how the called you and the current you are in a committed relationship. <laughs> the you that you've been called to be. Now, this is the part that's perplexing to me. When you come to Christ, you're no longer lost. All right? Nobody said nothing, so let me say it one more time. Let me rewind. <laughs> when you come to Christ, you're no longer lost. All right? All right. But now, here's the question. How am I in Christ, but still feel lost? Anybody ever been there? This too real? How am I in Christ? Like, I'm saved, but, but I still feel lost. And I remember Jesus said something. He said, unless you become like a child, unless you become like a child. Y'all see this little cute black boy? See that? Unless you, <laughs> unless you become like a child, you can't inherit the kingdom of God. So he's like, okay, unless I can get you back to here, are you really lost or have you been buried? Like, I need you to get back to there. You know why I need you to get back to here? Right here, I didn't care that my edge up wasn't straight. <laughs> right here, if the teacher made me mad, I forgave her in just a few moments. Think about children. They forgive quick. They will, they're able to learn fast. And then children have a lot of questions. Have you talked to one lately? Why you do this? Why you do that? Why you do this? Why? How are we Christians and children of God, but we don't question every teaching that we hear that contradicts who he is? Children have questions. So, Jerry, you, you're not lost. You've been buried. You know what you've been buried under? First thing, you live in this generation that would do anything for this. For likes, for views. I've seen people jump off mountains. I'm like, bro, you could have died. You could have, like, died. But likes. Because this is just proving that I really don't like me. So maybe if I can get more of your likes, then maybe somehow that will make me like me too. Maybe if I compromise my standard, I can get more likes. You're not lost, you're buried. That child, like, and then, you know how, like, our generation, you got to be, like, high, high achievement. You know what I'm saying? Like, you have to have, like, so many degrees. Like, you have more degrees than a thermostat. So you got one degree. I didn't graduate it. What's up? I'm smart now. I got one degree. You're buried under your achievement. 
This is so good, y'all. That, that wasn't enough. I want people to know I'm highly intelligent. So I, ha I have to get more degrees. I got another degree. This one's from Harvard. I need people to know I'm smart and intellectual. You're buried under that. Okay? Now I got to get my PhD. You know, you got to address me by doctor. <laughs> I killed my dissertation. So I want you to know about all these achievements I have. I got all these achievements. I'm Dr. Jerry Flowers. Don't call me Jerry. Don't even call me pastor. Doctor. <laughs> doctor. What's your name? Dr. Flowers. <laughs> Buried. Then, you know, you got to have money. I mean, what, what? This is fake money, by the way. It looks real, though, doesn't it? It looks real. It's $5 on Amazon. <laughs> So yeah, you got to have a whole lot of money. Make it rain. You got to be accomplished. You got to have all these zeros. So you're going to do anything you can for money. Some girls literally strip so that people could do this to them. You're going to do whatever you can to get money. I'm talking about stacks of money. You ever seen people take pictures like this? Just, just tons of money. You are buried under things that could burn. And you question how good God is by the lack of this. God is good when I got a lot of these. And so you become buried. And then, you know, you got to be able to always let people know I'm worth something. <laughs> I'm valuable. So I got to have a nice car. Got to have a nice car. My seat's warm by themselves. <laughs> so then you wonder why I feel so lost. You're under all of this. The real you. You're not lost, you're buried. You're buried. Under what people think, what your mom said, what the culture labels as success, what a fake pe a preacher told you, you're buried. And so now here you are, 35, 46, 27, 72. Don't even know who you are because your whole life you've been buried. Buried. Jesus... He puts it this way, Matthew chapter 18, verse 1. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is great. Greatness in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. Do you remember? If you could put the picture back, Carl, when I was a little boy. Can you remember how your personality was before you cared? if your clothes matched or not. I hate to say this, but do you remember the person you were before the molestation? Do you remember how quickly you would get happy? We're going to Chuck E. Cheese. Yay! Think about the joy that was always there when you were a child. Do you remember what that was like? Jesus is saying, I want to get you back to that place, but I, I, I can't get it back unless I can teach you to unlearn all of the stuff in your life that you thought gave you value. And it's uncomfortable because these things gave me significance. They gave me joy, but I lost the little boy. I lost the child like faith. I lost the trust that you're going to provide for me tomorrow. My children have never wondered what they're going to eat. They know they're going to eat. They don't ever worry about bills. Y'all remember what life was like before that? <laughs> they're not worried that gas prices are a million dollars a gallon. They're not worried about that. They just trust daddy going to handle it. Maybe the ultimate goal of God is to get us back like a child. We trust him. And have you lost yourself, buried underneath everything that you labeled success? You're not lost. You've been buried. And unlearning 
is digging you up. So good, y'all. It's digging you up. So number one, how do I unlearn? You have to have a willingness to depart from the familiar. Did y'all hear what I just said? For those, okay, I need to unlearn. How? Are you willing to depart from what was familiar to you? Because I can't get you to a promised land from an Egypt you don't want to leave. You have to be willing to depart. Number two, pursue the unknown. Be curious over mystery again. How are we going to get the building? I don't know, but I trust that I'm going to enjoy the mystery of it. I'm going to enjoy the mystery of the process. So one day I'll be able to say, look what God did. I don't have to know the answers right now. I have learned to embrace the mystery. We have lost the mystery because we want to know the destination, the how, the when, the what. And so that takes the trust. Pursue the unknown. Number three, don't mislabel the unlearning. Okay? What do I mean by that? I'm so lonely. No, you are unlearning using people as a means of happiness. Don't mislabel the unlearning. Okay, man, this is just so boring. No, this is what peace feels like. You have to unlearn chaos. Don't mislabel the unlearning. Man, ain't nobody doing this. Okay, unlearn hanging with bottom feeders. Because bottom feeders, they only eat what settles. And whatever settles is something at the bottom. Gosh. It's something at the bottom. Nobody's doing this. No, you're used to hanging with catfish. They're bottom feeders. I'm taking you to another level. Don't mislabel the unlearning. Number four, surround yourself with similar diets. Who in your life is unlearning Egypt too? If all of your friends are still in Egypt, they're going to send you invitations daily. <laughs> I need to hang around people who are trusting God to deliver them from losing the little child too. I need to hang with people with similar diets because friends extend to you their diet. Your friend who meal preps say, girl, you better stop eating like that. Your friend who eats Starburst say, girl, you want some? <laughs> Am I lying though? Surround yourself with similar diets. Last point, find pleasure in manna. That's Jesus. Find pleasure in him. Like I told us last week, my prayer, I was as transparent as I could be. I prayed this to God. If you don't change my desires, I'm never going to give up porn. Because I don't see you as more pleasurable than this. It sounds bad, but this is how I talk to God. You're not more pleasurable to me than that. So if I'm going to go all out for you, train me and teach me how to experience that you are more pleasurable. Because until you do that, I'm always tempted to go back. I'm always tempted to go back. Until the alcohol starts to give me an aftertaste of conviction, I'm always going to go back. Help me learn that your buzz is better than that. If you don't teach me that the most high is better than this high, I'm always going to get this high, and then I'm never going to look to the most high. Help me experience that you give me the most high. Because if you don't, God, I, I can't be free from this. I can't be free from this. So it's, it's finding that fulfillment, fulfillment in Jesus to where we're not like, the children of Israel, we die in the unlearning. But whatever you have to empty out, empty out. this looks like a mess on the stage. Y'all can't see it in the back. Stuff is broken. Fake money is everywhere. It looks a mess. Unlearning is messy. And until you're okay with the mess, so he can make you a messenger, he'll keep on going back find an identity in this let's pray God we hear you 
And we're asking God, help us to truly see the addictions and the temptations of this life as spoiled. They won't fulfill. They won't satisfy. They only gratify. Help us to find that joy in you, God, and help us to be willing to submit to you digging up the little child that we lost so that we could trust with ease again, that we could forgive with ease again. We could know that daddy's gonna give us our daily bread again, just like a child. Would you help? Would you redeem back unto us the child-like trust? Children can articulate that we're in a pandemic, pandemic, but they're not stressed out by it. Help us stop being stressed by what we see. But we ask you, King of glory, sweet savior quench our thirst they've been so thirsty for so many things but they leave us more dehydrated than we were in the first place but we're asking just like the woman at the well help us to leave our bucket because we met god's fountain in jesus name we pray amen